Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2018 Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Tyrol Museum and its Cooperating Society are pleased to welcome back a regular guest of the Speaker Series, Dr. John Node. John is a petroleum geologist based in Calgary who has his own consulting firm called Sedimental uh, Services and he's also an instructor at Mount Royal University. Uh, John obtained his undergraduate degree from Imperial College in London, England, after working as a mining geologist in South Africa and as a marine geologist planning undersea cable route for British Telecom in the UK. John completed a master's degree in sedimentology with his thesis focusing on the fluvial sequence stratigraphy of Dinosaur Provincial Park. Upon completing his thesis, John return, returned to the University of London to pursue his PhD on the sedimentary evolution of eastern Borneo. After completing his PhD, John was lured by oil companies and over the years has worked on a variety of Middle Eastern and Canadian exploration projects. In 2016, he set up his own consultancy firm, Sedimental Services, and uh, has been successful ever since. Through all of this, John has always been and remains to this day a real paleontology enthusiast. Today, John will review the fauna that inhabited the Creta Cretaceous Chalk Sea of England. So without further delay, I present you Dr. John Node. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming today. Uh, I'm Today I'm going to be talking about a subject that's very close to my heart and uh, I, I'm, I would not normally dedicate a talk but this one has to be dedicated to my mum because when I was uh, eight or nine years old she used to drive me out to the local chalk quarry so that I could go fossil hunting. So uh, uh, quite a few of the specimens that you're going to see today, are the, they've come from the, those former times from uh, long ago. Just to, just to note that uh, there's a lot of images in here, not all of them are mine, and if anybody's interested in reproducing them, then just please contact me and I can give you the references. So the chalk seas cover much of the Cretaceous world, and they can be seen in outcrop everywhere from the UK to Western Australia, from Kansas to China, and it, you can go all the way to Western Australia and you can see chalk, which is identical in terms of its consistency and fossil content to, to the UK. The fossils are often perfectly preserved in this very fine-grained sediment. And the nice thing for a young fossil hunter is that you can remove a lot of this chalk with a toothbrush, so you can really prep out these fossils beautifully. And I have brought a few samples which people are welcome to have a look at at the end, some of the uh, echinoderms from the chalk. Little consideration has been given to the varied styles of preservation of the fossils that we do see from the chalk, and how this relates to paleoecology and also to taphonomy. So this is how they lived in the chalk sea, uh, which was very, very soupy, uh, certainly on the sea floor, and what happened to them after they died. So today I'm gonna try and elucidate some of that and talk a little bit about how these fossils, how these animals were adapted to living in these very, very soft conditions. So let's start off with a little bit of geology. There's a lot of historical research on the chalk, obviously with uh, places, Items like this giant horse here, the horse, white horse of Uffington and the white cliffs of Dover, there's been a general interest in the, the geology of the chalk from, from Paleolithic times. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the detail of the, the discussions that were put together to decide on the stratigraphy of the chalk, but after a lot of, lot of work by a lot of different researchers, we ended up with three main divisions, the lower chalk, the middle chalk, and the upper chalk. And it's very nice to see that uh, a, a meeting in the British Geological Survey in 1999 of all of the major chalk researchers allowed them to sit down and standardize the stratigraphy. And they upgraded the members to formations, so they ended up with really quite an, a nice framework for the chalk itself. So back in those days, around 70 million years ago, the, the world was really in a greenhouse climate, and there were no ice caps. The average temperatures around the world were somewhere around 26 degrees centigrade. So this led to very high sea levels. So that because we had no ice caps, all of the ice had been uh, melted. And so we had a very watery world with a lot less land than we would see today. And this created numerous shallow seas with very little terrigenous input. So we're not getting a lot of uh, erosion from land. The seas are just sitting there, so all of the material that's accumulating in the seas, most of it's accumulating from bugs that are dying. 
And sedimentation in the chalk seas was dominated by coccolithophores, which bloom in shallow water. And these deposited a, a calcareous ooze on the seabed. And I'll show you in a minute what those look like. So the water depth at that time was estimated at around 200 to 300 meters. And there was, despite this deep water depth, there were, there were a lot of currents there and a lot of scouring and a lot of rippling, suggesting either that there, there were strong currents passing through there or at certain times it was shallower than this. And there's strong evidence of cyclicity at this time as well, which I'll show you in a little while. So the chalk sea lasted for around 30 million years. So that's a very long time for us to be able to explore the stratigraphic interval. And just to show you here, I'm going to be talking mainly about the chalk of the UK because that's what I grew up with. And that's this big green stripe that runs down through the map here. So the White Cliffs of Dover are going to be sitting over here. And we've got uh, the London Basin sitting in here with younger sediments. But right around London, you can see we're surrounded by the North Downs and the South Downs, which are all made up of the chalk. So what are coccolithophores? Well, they're a kind of algae, and they, are, they were so abundant that they made up the chalk. And as you can see from this beautiful slide here, they, they, they were very, very pretty animals. So this was an algal creature that was made up of a series of these carbon, calcium carbonate platelets. And the purpose is somewhat unclear, although they, they, were, they, they were transparent. So that suggests that they may have had some relevance to photosynthesis. And the precipitation of these, so the, the way that the animal made this calcium carbonate, may have freed uh, up the carbon dioxide to, to associate with that process. So these are not big animals. These, these are microscopic animals in size. And you can see that they, you can estimate there's around 60 billion per meter cubed. And these were deposited annually after their deaths and later cemented up. So that there were an awful lot of them. So if you're holding a stick of chalk in your hand, there's a, a few million of these coccolithophores sitting within that chalk. And the, the modern version of these animals, Emiliana huxtii, is one of, it's the animal that's responsible for a lot of algal blooms, so, uh, as well as forming a lot of calcareous oozes in deep water. So pretty much identical animals are still around today. And the planktonic forams, so these guys, and inner ceramus, which is a kind of bivalve that we'll talk about in a little while, the, 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 the elements of the shell of that bivalve contributed vastly to the, the chalk ground mass. And there were also a few other animals that contributed as well, but the vast majority was made up of these. So just to talk a little bit about sea level, I said that sea level was relatively high at this time. And uh, as a sedimentologist and geologist, it's something that we are always concerned about is what happens with sea level. And you can see here that this is low sea level is over here on the right and high sea level on the left. And you can see at the period that we're looking at here in the upper chalk, the sea level really was relatively high and one of the highest that it's ever been in, in, in the history of the Earth. So uh, this was a very warm and, and very wet time. As I said about the stratigraphy, uh, the, the um, researchers in the past came to a landing and subdividing the chalk into three major parts. And so the, the lower chalk shown here in the picture, you can see is gray, it's argillaceous, which means it's very muddy, doesn't have any flints in it, and often it's made up of quite rhythmic bedding. The middle chalk is a white chalk, so more typical of the chalks that we would imagine, with a few flints, and sometimes it's very nodular in consistency, so it has a, a lot of rounded shapes within it. And then the upper chalk is more the, the classic chalk that people would imagine in the UK, which is another white chalk mass with these very striking black intervals made up of flints. And this is what we'll be concentrating on in, in the talk today. So looking at, at chalk outcrops, so these, these outcrops are from uh, the Needles, which is at the, the western end of the Isle of Wight in the southern UK. So a very, very famous area. There are a lot of shipwrecks here in the past, and there's some, some beautiful lighthouses that have been put in this area through time. And I think what you can see here is that you've got this very, very stripy appearance. So this section here is about 55, 60 meters in thickness. And every one of these black bands in here is a band of these flints. So it's very, very cyclic in character. And so what we're seeing here is perturbations in the Earth's orbit, small perturbations in the Earth's orbit, which are changing the depositional characters very, very slightly. So during the, the white bits, you're getting more deposition. And during the black bits, you're getting pauses in deposition, which allow a lot of bugs to start burrowing. And then those burrows are later cemented up. So let's talk a little bit more about the flints. And the upper chalk, as I said, it has common layers of flints, 
And uh, I've put this log in here. This is an example from the ENCI quarry, which is a very famous quarry in southern Maastricht. Maastricht is famous for being the place where a lot of EU contracts were signed, but it's also very, very famous as the home of the Maastrichtians, so that the youngest age of the chalk. And it has this classic sedimentology here, once again, with the, this white chalk with a lot of flint bands. And you can correlate these individual bands over distances of at least kilometers in length. So that also suggests that there's a, a regional driver that's causing the, the, the interaction of these, these flints and chalk through time. So the silica in these deposits is thought to have been produced by sponges. So you have these glass sponges, a bit, little bit like the sponges you, you would have in your bathroom at home. And after they die, the, the, the glass sponges break down, and you end up with these tiny little triangular spicules, they're called. So these little tiny bits of glass and they, they go into suspension in the sediment. And the, 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 they're sitting within the sediment, and they gradually turn into a kind of gel. And then that gel becomes mobile, and it will it tend to cement around anything that's got organic material. So we have these rather nice shrimps that were living at that time who would use their own organic matter, in fact, their poop, uh, to line their burrows. And I'm, I wouldn't recommend using your poop as wallpaper, but the, for some reason, the shrimp seemed to find that it made a nice strong burrow. And what happened was that after death, or after, after these, these burrows were buried, then the, the silica would be mobilized and it would form a cast around those burrows. So a lot of the flints that you see, and this is just one example here, where the flint actually has little scratches on it that were made by the shrimps at the time. So we really have to thank the shrimp poop for, and, the, and the glass sponges for preserving so many of these fossils, because the fossils are often preserved as flint casts within the chalk. So this is my favorite ever fossil. So I, I've seen an awful lot of fossils in my life, and this is my favorite of all. And so flint doesn't just make casts of the burrows, it makes casts of other fossils as well. And this is a fossil from the upper chalk. It's a, a heart-shaped sea urchin called Micrasto, which I'll be talking about later on. But this example here is special for not just for being a sea urchin, but because it's a geopetal structure. And a geopetal structure is a structure where you can tell which way up the rocks are by looking at the fossil inside them. So what's happening here is that uh, you had this a sea urchin with a shell, and the shell was gradually filled up with sediment after the sea urchin died. But what happened with that sediment is that most of the sediment was, uh, was quite muddy. So the muddy sediment here was at the bottom of the, the inside of that filling. So you can imagine we've got this hollow shell, and we're just gently pouring in sediment through this, well, there's no other word for it, through the anus of the sea urchin. So rather than stuff coming out of the anus, we're actually feeding material into the anus. So the, the sea urchin filled up partly with this sediment, but then the rest of the, 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 set, the hollow cast of this sea urchin was made up of silica. So basically, we have a, a sea urchin here that the bottom half is mud, but the top half is pure glass. So we have a, a fossil that's made out of glass, which is, to me is just astounding. And, and the, you can see the detail here that's preserved in the glass in this sea urchin. So this is a, a treasured sample of mine from the UK. So just to look a little, a little bit more at the sedimentology, the, as I said, the chalk is white and the flints are back. And uh, what we see in the, in the Maastrichtian sediments and also in the UK chalk is that you have coarsening upward cycles, which are probably storm-related. And these storms also give wavy tops to some of these beds. So if you look at that bed here, this is from uh, the, the northeastern coast of the UK around Flamborough Head. And you can see that you've got these, the, some topography on the seabed here that was caused by storms. And that suggests that despite the paper by Melville, that sometimes the water depth was less than 100 meters to allow the storms to interact with the seabed. You also see hard grounds within the chalk, and this is where you have pauses in deposition. So sometimes these will be cemented up by these flints, but sometimes you'll just end up with a highly cemented surface, which is heavily burrowed. You can see the burrows that are sitting in here. And what, what, the reason for this is that you, you pause deposition, so maybe there, there were less creatures, in, less of those algae living in the water column, or maybe you, you had um, somewhat uh, further from the coast at that time, or drop in sea, relative sea level, but in any case, the cyclicity means that you occasionally get these hard grounds and they, and they cement up. So it's quite interesting to see what happens here because most of the time our model of the chalk is that it was very, very thixotropic. So it was almost like a soup on the seabed, very soft, just made up of this ooze of uh, algal bits. But every now and again, you would get a situation where you'd start cementing up 
and preserving some of the burrow structures as well. So it's it, this interplay between these hard grounds, which form, as I said, when you have relative sea level lows, the, the regression in sea level, and the chalk in between them, which was really much more soupy. So on the seabed, on the chalk seabed, there's definitely evidence from seismic and from some of the layers that we can track out that there were domes and ridges within the sea, seabed. So it wasn't just this wide expanse of nothing. There was actually stuff going on on the seabed. There were large-scale mass movements with materials sliding down on really quite gentle gradients. But most of the time, on, in the detail layer, you can, uh, when you zoom in to look at the seabed itself, the upper 10 to 20 centimeters is thixotropic, so that's where your soup is with 50% or more water content, and ha has a kind of jelly-like consistency, and the burrowing animals in it made it even more fluidized, and then progressively it becomes firmer beneath, behaving more plastically. So this is what we're going to be looking at today, as the animals that we're having to try and survive in this 10 to 20 centimeters of soup. And you can see this is what the seabed looks like in a modern calcareous ooze. So this is a rain of algal material that's raining down onto the seabed. So let's move on to the paleontology. This is the focus of the talk. And just before I go any further, what I'm going to try and show you today is that certain organisms were definitely adapted to living in this environment. So they, they changed the way, they changed their own morphology to try and adapt to living in this soupy environment. So anytime you see a green slide, that's a slide where I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that this animal was adapted specifically to living in the soup. So we're going to start off by looking at Inoceramus, and this is the biggest bivalve in the world. And you can see here's a lovely, friendly chap demonstrating just how big some of these animals are. And this one is almost as big, this, this Inoceramus sitting here as well. So they're an extinct type of bivalve. They live on the seabed and they superficially resemble oysters, and they have a thick shell that's paved with prisms of calcite. But the most important thing about these is that they, are, they have this giant size. And the reason they had such a giant size, first of all, they think it's to give them a large gill area so that they could get more oxygen into their gills, but also it acted as sort of a snowshoe on the seabed. So if, you, if, you, if you're going to try and support yourself on something that's basically like quicksand, then just having your own feet is going to be a problem. But if you have some big snowshoes on your feet, then you're going to be able to support yourself on the seabed. So I, I, I do believe that the, the, this modification to become so large, and yet with a shell that's only a, a couple of centimeters thick, was definitely to help it to survive on the seabed. Another bivalve that's commonly encountered in, in the chalk seas is Spondylus spinosa, and these, the Spondylus is still a, a, a alive today. This is a modern one. They call them the thorny oyster. And these, these specimens, they have very long spines. So you can see this with this, um, this specimen from my collection here, that you have the shell itself, which looks something like a scallop, but you have these long spines protruding from it. And the spines could be up to 10 to 12 centimeters in length for really quite a small animal. So I think that these were quite useful in terms of holding it up on the seabed, because it's, it's hard to believe that they would have these purely as a defense mechanism, because they're pretty e easy to break off, and any fish that was interested in having a meal could make its way into that shell. So it seems to me more likely that these, these spines were used to help to support it in that soft substrate. There are also lots of ammonites in the seabed, and am ammonites do not have to adapt themselves to living in a thixotropic environment because they were floating around, but I'm including them for the sake of completeness, and also because there are really some quite interesting forms. So the chalk was towards the end of the Cretaceous, the last 30 million years of the Cretaceous and the very early Paleocene. So at that time, ammonites had been around for a long time, and it appeared that there'd certainly... That theories that uh, animals began experimenting. So they, they changed their forms and tried out new forms. And some of the forms that we see in these ammonites are these heteromorph forms. So rather than just being the normal spiral ammonites, like the Schloenbachia over here, we'd have ones that were, had much looser spirals, or they had a, a, almost like a U-tube shape, and then ones that look more like gastropods. This is Terolites, which is probably one of the most common. So it's these ammonites were really quite varied in form and, and uh, vastly different to some of the earlier specimens that you'd see in the Jurassic. Uh, 
There were also belemnites. So once again, these are animals that live in the water column, so they weren't affected by the thick tropic sediments, but there, there are many, many species of belemnites. And what a belemnite is, what this, this belemnite actually is, is the inside of a sort of fossil squid. So they weren't exactly squids, but they were very closely related to squids. So this, this would be the, the, almost like the backbone inside that stopped the back, the back of this squid-like animal from drooping down. And they're very, very common. They're very, very commonly preserved. So you don't often see the fine-grained soft material. You tend to see just the, the, the hard parts of the, of the animal preserved, so which is these belemnites. And they vary in size from a few millimeters to more than 30 centimeters in length. And one of the nice things about them is that you can see here with this example, and this is from the chalk, that these belemnites are aligned. So they, 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 they're all go in the same direct, pointing in the same direction. And what that suggests is that there was some kind of currents acting on the seabed as well. And I mean, that's important because it also shows that the, that the seabed was far more active. It wasn't just a deep marine ooze, but that there were currents acting on these, these sediments and these fossils as well. So this is just a few other selected invertebrates before we move on to my, my favorites, the, the, the echinoderms. So we can see that we have bryozoans here, which are a kind of sea moss. We have brachiopods, which are, in the modern day, there are only a few species left, but they were, they were very, very common. And uh, they, they, they fed by using an internal cilia structure, so to, to, to uh, help them to sieve uh, food out of the, sea, the seawater. There were gastropods, so a, a variety of uh, snail shells, circulid worms, sponges. And these are not glass sponges, that, that, like the ones I was talking about that made the flint. These are, that, but the flint is around them, so this is a flint casing around some of these nice sponges here. There were also corals, crustaceans, uh, other bivalves to the ones we've talked about already, and some forams as well, so some uh, microfossils as well. So a, a nice variety of animals that were living in the sediment. But let's move on and talk about the echinoids. And the echinoids is probably the, the fossil that's the most famous from the chalk. And this particular one here is called Micraster, and very appropriate on Valentine's week to have this beautiful heart-shaped sea urchin. And the echinoderms form a large and particularly diverse component of the chalk fauna. They were probably the most successful invertebrates in the chalk. And they occur as regular sea urchins, which we'll talk about the difference between regular and irregular. So the regular ones have a nice rounded shape and irregular sea urchins as well, which have bilateral symmetry like this, this sea urchin here. And they're extremely common in the UK and elsewhere, partly because it's easy to preserve them as an internal cast. So you remember my favorite fossil earlier? Well, this is just another example where we have the actual sea urchin sitting here with its test, so with its shell made out of calcium carbonate, but often they were filled with flints. And so this is a flint example where it's an internal cast in flint of that sea urchin. So irregular sea urchins, their morphology, so they had bilateral symmetry. And I guess the most important aspects to point out are the mouth or peristome, the periproct or the anus, and then these nice petaloid structures here as well. So the way that this animal lived was that it had lots of holes in the test. And through these holes, it will protrude what are called tube feet. So this is showing some of those tube feet that are waving around in the sea and collecting food material, which is then transported to the mouth. So the tube feet will transport the material to the mouth, and the, the material will often be passed along these petals. And then the petals also facilitate currents that help to carry the waste products away from the anus area. So they, the, the petals help to carry food to the mouth, and then to carry the waste products away. So they, those petals do have a purpose. They're not just to make it look pretty. And then they also have what's called an apical disc. So that's sitting up here. And that disc is interesting because it has genital plates, but it also has ocular plates. So they, they, they did have some very primitive form of vision that they could tell whether or not they were in light or dark, which is not what you would expect for a, a sea urchin. So th the most famous and uh, uh, the most useful of the echinoderms is probably an echinoderm called Micrasta. And Micrasta has it changed its character through time. So this is a timeline here going from older to younger. And you can see that the shape of the sea urchin changes through time. And this is also shown in this diagram here with you know, smaller, longer, thinner forms becoming wider, bigger petals through time. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what these might signify, these differences. But this was recognized right the way back in the 1800s in the, in the UK. And this animal was really the first animal that was used as a stratigraphic marker. 
So depending on the shape of the hearts, they, you could tell almost exactly where you were. And Roe, who was one of the, the big workers on the, on the chalk, he said that if you dropped him on a beach in the middle of the night with a torch and a hammer, he would find a micraster and he would be able to tell you where he was in the stratigraphy. So he, that's, that, just because of the, the changes in the sea urchins were so dramatic and so marked through time. So there's a bit of a problem with micraster because micraster, as we said in the previous slide, it changed its form from back in 30, over 30 million years from this form to this form. So what that meant was that you have a lot of transitional forms as you go through from these older ones to the younger ones. And some people who, some guys, they, they, in, in paleontology we call them splitters, want to make everything that's slightly different a different species. So if I was a splitter and I looked at this room, I'd say, well, there's some tall people over there, so that's one species, and then we've got some small, rounder people over there, no offense, uh, you're another species, and then some, someone who's been on holiday, they, you, look like you have a tan, would then make you another species, so they would end up with all of these different micraster species. So th these are all species which have been published and described, but I think really they've gone a little bit too far because what, we've, what we actually have is that we have one thin, long form at the bottom and we have a kind of fatter form at the top here, the Karanguran at the top, and then we've got a lot of transitional forms in between. So I think probably there are a few too many names erected. This comes from a, a fantastic website that, from a, a, someone who probably likes Micrastas even more than I do, and he's got all of these pictures on the, the website, so I've, I've borrowed these from this website down here. So apart from the fact that you have this change and transition in forms through time, you also have two classes of Micrasta at any one horizon. And what you have is that you have a normal form, although your normal is probably not my normal, but you have a normal, much more common sea urchin, which is usually rounder and flatter. And then you have what's called a gibbous form, which is taller and thinner. So these sea urchins, they may not look like it, but these are the, from the same species, but they are the two forms. And both of these, these come from my quarry that my mum used to drive me to. So they're, they're both forms that I found in the same quarry, same stratigraphic horizon, and uh, they are from the same species, but you can see how different they look. This much more pointy, much more high, high apexed form is just an, a, a subdivision of the of the other the other sea urchin. And there's a theory that, that that they were probably separate species at any one time. So we'd have the normal one sitting here. This is a graph of total height of test against the height of the of the top of the the, the anus. So just a, one measurement that you can use to separate the gibbous forms the normal forms, but then you have some inbreeding forms in the middle here. So a little bit like humans and Neanderthals, all of us have a little bit of Neanderthal in us, some of us probably more than others. You probably know a few that have. And this, this would be some of those inbred, interbred uh, creatures in the middle here. So what happened to Micrasta through time? How did it change? Well, the test became broader and higher. So the test is just another name for the shell. The anterior groove that led to the mouth, so at the back here, that became deeper. The petals became elongated, and the surface of the plates became more granular. The mouth moved further forward, so it started off at the end here, and it moved more into the, the body of the test. And uh, a, a couple of other things happened as well. The tubercules, which is just the, the little bumps on the plastron coarsened as well. And the plastron is kind of the plate at the base of the sea urchin. So these changes happen through time and they've been interpreted to represent progressive adaptation to deeper burrowing. So this sea urchin was changing the way it behaved to help it with the burrowing. So the different things, so the anterior groove, that deepened, so that would help with food gathering. The petals elongated, so that meant it could have more tube feet and it would be able to get more oxygen out in its little burrow when it's sitting down here. Um, the surface of the plates is more granular, which allows more cilia, which improves water flow. So the idea is that it started off shallow, and as, as it burrowed deeper through time, so time, as I've shown here with the arrow, is, is getting younger as you go towards the right, and as it burrowed deeper, it needed to have better mechanisms to get the currents to go around it, because the currents will be bringing food into it, and they would also be giving it a chance to respire. So why might it have burrowed deeper? Well, one of the reasons might be because the, the seabed was so soupy that it wasn't able really to support itself at shallower depths. But maybe there's another reason. Maybe it might be that you had a plesiosaurs were finding better ways to feed and they were coming down onto the seabed and they were digging these guys out.
So maybe the microsters were trying to find a way to hide out for, and not, not be eaten. So as well as microsta, there were other sea urchins. So Echinochorus is another one, which is uh, very commonly found in the, the UK. And I have examples of both of them to show you guys at the end, hand specimens. And you can see that Echinochorus equally comes in a whole variety of forms. And they have been given separate species names, but whether or not those species are justified or whether these are just these transitional forms again is a good question. And you can see that interestingly, just like the microsters, we have the normal forms. So there's the normal form in the middle. And we have a very high spired form and a very fat form, gibbous form as well. So that just like microsta, we have a very wide range. And you don't have so many transitional forms in between these. You have three different types. So maybe these were three different subspecies, or maybe they were just associated with um, something to do with the substrate. So this is to show you an example here of what you most normally find is this is a flint cast of one of these echinochoruses as well. You don't always find them with these beautiful shells on. So the variations in echinochorus through time increase in the size of the apical system. So that was those discs at the top, which had the ocular plates. And it becomes rounder. So that helps it with burrowing. And a change from an elliptical to a more circular shape. And that, that may also be helping with, with the burrowing and helping it to bed itself down in the burrows. And the change in position of the largest pores as well. And the test size increases and decreases through time. And the explanation for this is probably associated, once again, with the burrowing mode of life and the fact that you had changes in chalk lithology through time that you could tie into these changes in the sea urchin morphology. So another thing that's very interesting to look at in sea urchins is that they, they have lots of creatures colonizing them. And why is this very important? It means that they must have been exposed after burial. Because if they were in their burrows, then the animals wouldn't be able, and then, then they were just buried. Then the, these little animals that are growing on them, the fungal borings, the cirripedes, the worms, the snails, they wouldn't have been able to predate on them unless these were exposed. So that also suggests that you may have had pauses in deposition and actually scouring, exposing these animals after death. And that made them into little islands. And it's a little bit like when you have dead whales. So if it, when a whale falls to the seabed, that whale is colonized by a whole variety of organisms, and they use it as an island on the seabed. So you'll see animals on dead whales that you will not find anywhere else in, on the seabed, because they're using it as a colonization point. And the same thing happens with sea urchins. So that's definitely showing that there must have been pauses in deposition at that time and the exposure of these animals. And this is just to show you what some of those epifauna look like. So this is an echinochorus with a serpented worm and with a, a, a smaller set of worm tubes on it. We've got a, a, a set of bivalves here on a piece of uh, a microsta. And then we have some worm tubes and some bryzoan, so some algal devices on here. And then I've got a, a sketch here that I made of uh, a barnacle growing on one of these ambical plates. So during life, these creatures would have, the sea urchins would have had their tube feet. So there wouldn't have been any way that these animals could have colonized them until after they died. And they, they stopped pushing their tube feet out of their shells. So let's move on to look at some of the other sea urchins. And these are just incredible creatures. These are sidaroids. So these are regular sea urchins. And these are some of the ones you, you occasionally see them for sale in shops when you're on holiday, if you go to nice warm places for your holiday. And they're characterized by relatively small shells and these giant club-like spines. And I think that there's a good chance that these clubs, once again, it's hard to imagine that they would have been much of a defense against any predators because they could have just moved in for the kill and gone in at the base of the, the shell here where the, the Aristotle's lantern would be posted. This is the kind of jaws of the sea urchin. So I think that once again, that there's a good chance that these club-like adaptations, and some of them had very long, thin spines, were used to hold them up on, on a very soft seabed. And this is just to show you what some of those long spines look like. So we've got a relatively small sea urchin test here or shell here but it's got these giant spines, which I, help, I think would have helped it to support itself. So that would be a little bit like putting your arms out if you're in that quicksand to stop yourself sinking into this quicksand. And then we have this really extraordinary sea urchin called Hachinoia. And Hachinoia is just, it's a totally unique sea urchin. So it has the normal test shape down here, so the normal shell shape, but for some reason it has grown this enormous ass. This is its, its, its anus up here, so it's pushed, it's, the anus is twice as long as the body, which I'm, I haven't met many people like that, fortunately. 
And I think what's going on here is this creature is it's adapted to a burrowing mode of life. It's down in the sediment, but it does not want to have its waste products anywhere near it. It's obviously very fastidious, maybe a little bit of OCD. So it grew this enormous anus, anal tube here so that it could push the waste out further up its burrow. So once again, it's a, this is allowing it to live buried within the sediment while still maintaining contact with the surface waters. So there's lots of other echinoderms in the chalk as well. And first of all, there's crinoids, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, sea lilies. And the interesting thing about the chalk is that you do get a few with stalks, but the stalks, they often have, once again, these props that would help to support them on the seabed. So that's a, that's, that's a fairly normal kind of uh, uh, crinoid. But we also have these floating crinoids. So these are stemless crinoids. So they're like nomadic crinoids. So they're sea lilies that are, they use their arms to flail backwards and forwards in the water column to move them around in the water column while they're collecting material. And so you, the fact that you see these stemless crinoids suggests that either they were floating, but if they did ever land on the seabed, they'd have to be partly buried in the seabed while those arms were extended. So they'd need to have this very rounded cup to support them. But they spent a lot of time actually just floating around in the water column. There are also asteroids, and asteroids is not those things that are coming down to whack into the Earth, but is another name for, uh, for starfish. And what you notice about the starfish from the chalk is a lot of them, firstly, are very thin, and secondly, have very big, flat arms. And I think, once again, this is to, some, it's to do with the snowshoe lifestyle. So you can see here that this is not how you expect a normal starfish to be. You expect to have five big arms sticking out, but what we've got here is starfish that don't really have any arms at all. So they're busy supporting themselves a little bit like a pizza in a pizza box. So they're, they're big, flat structures that can, uh, like a snowshoe, that can rest on the seabed. And you can see that in a whole variety of species that you find within the chalk. So I'm just going to digress for a moment here and talk a little bit about chalk echinoderms in folklore because, they, as I said, these are extremely common fossils in the UK and, and partly because of glaciation, we, we had a lot of them exposed and a lot of them survive very well because they're, the, they're made out of this very hard flint. So these are what, what, what they look like when you find them in the field. And so they were given all sorts of names. They were, they were used as hand axes, they were called shepherd's crowns, they were interpreted as snake eggs. They were called dew stones and star stones, and also St. Cuthbert's beads, which were made up of these crinoidal fragments as well. So they were, they were, they were very, very popular in the cultures stretching back far before uh, modern man. And one of the most dramatic discoveries was in, from the Neolithic, which is a Bronze Age echinoderm burial. And graves were found on the hills in Dunstable Downs, so close to where I grew up in northwest London. And they found a, a young woman's grave with uh, two species of echinoderms around her. And there were over 200 echinoderms that they'd put around her body. So they were Micraster and Echinochoris, which are both echinoderms that we're, we're very familiar with now. And they found her body preserved with a child. So let's talk about the vertebrates. Now, I, I'm not going to suggest that the vertebrates were adapted in a particular way to deal with this soft seabed but they're, they're a very important component of, of the chalk sea. And first of all, I'm just going to show you a few of the fossil fish. And probably the most striking fossil fish fossil that you're likely to find is one of these teeth. And these are teeth of a, from a, a, a ray from, called Tychodus. And it has this huge crushing plate. So that's what the, the mouth looked like. So if you can imagine, if you opened your mouth, and instead of just having teeth around the edge, you had teeth all the way to the back. So if you could imagine, that's kind of how the array's mouth works. And what it does is it has these two plates made up of all of these teeth, and then it would grind these plates together to, to grind up any bivalves that it caught. So it, it would be eating those giant inoceramuses that we saw earlier, those big, flat bivalves. And the reason we know this is that we find their coprolites, so their poops, with, with pieces of these, these inoceramuses in them. So that's an example of one of these poops. And there's some other nice fish here, like Xyphactinus, which uh, are found in Kansas, beautifully preserved fish as well, and up, up to five meters in length. So we also have a lot of sharks in the UK, and sharks are, are always troubling animals, because generally speaking, they're, they're, they don't have bones, they have cartilage, and the cartilage tends to erode away, so you, you usually only find their teeth. 
And there are a few extraordinary examples like this where you do find other parts of the organism, but generally speaking, it's all about the shark's teeth. So all I can tell you is that there were a lot of sharks living in the chalk. This is a beautiful jaw from a, a shark, from a cow shark, actually, that lived, lived in the UK back at 70 or 80 million years ago. But uh, you don't tend to find mu much other material from the sharks. However, you do find really well-preserved marine reptiles. And while they weren't specifically adapted to life in the chalk, the chalk has yielded some of the best marine reptiles ever found. And areas like Kansas in the UK, Maastricht in the Netherlands were great places to find them, and also Morden from, from, uh, from uh, the, the next door province in Saskatchewan has discovered some amazing, relatively complete specimens. So Mosasaurus was a, a, among the last of the Mosasaurs, so we, we're, we're talking towards the end of the time when they were alive, and the largest, so up to 17 meters in length. And it's believed they live near the surface, preying on fish, turtles, ammonites, mosasaurs, birds, pterosaurs, plesiosaurs. They would eat pretty much anything. And the first skull was found all the way back in 1764. This is a picture of it here. And it was bought by the Tylers Museum in Harlem and described as a big fish. And then the second skull was found in 1770. And uh, following this, Maastricht was captured by the French in 1794. And Napoleon, he wanted to have this specimen for his, for his personal use. So this guy, the Commissar Fresin, offered some bottles of wine, which is obviously a great way to increase the size of your fossil collection, to the first person who would bring the skull to, to give to Napoleon. So uh, that's, this is a picture of them actually taking the skull out and, and transporting it to Napoleon as war booty. So even back then, the, 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 they recognized the significance and the value of these skulls. And I put this picture in here of, a, of an orca just to show you that, that this is a pretty similar lifestyle between these two animals. So interesting to think about that, that they may have behaved in the same way and things like throwing themselves up on the beaches to catch seal-like animals and also in deeper waters catching some of these deeper water animals like other mosasaurs. So bear the mosasaur is a particularly famous example. And the reason I've included bear in, in this rather than necessarily choosing Bruce from Morden is because bear has a beer named after him. And it's not every mosasaur that can say that. So bear was found in Maastricht in 1998. And he's actually a prognathodon saturator. That's his, his, his true name. And the degree of articulation of this, this specimen, that, that you can see how incredibly well it is preserved, suggests that it, it died, it hit the seafloor moments after death, it was scavenged by sharks but covered up relatively quickly. And we have found similar animals to this in Alberta and in, um, in Saskatchewan as well. And it's interesting that one of the Alberta specimens has a 1.6 meter fish, a sea turtle, and an ammonite in its stomach. So that also helps to show what the, the kind of animals that these guys were eating. So other mosasaurs were found in the same quarry as bear in 2012 and 2015, and they were called Christine and Lars. And I think most of these animals were named after the, the, the person who discovered them. So that's if you want to have a mosasaur named after you, you have to get out there and find one. And it's an interesting quarry. The, the, this, this, once again, this is the ENCI quarry in Maastricht. And they actually dug tunnels in the Second World War to house the soldiers in, 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 inside the quarry. So as I said, Bear was, has a special beer named after him by the Gulpener, which is a great name for a brewery, the Gulping Brewery in Limburg in the Netherlands. And this is the, the labels from the beer. And I, I have a treasured glass as well from the Bear Saturator beer. And it's a nice style of beer, the Dunkel style of beer, dark orange amber, heavy honey, honey and caramel on the nose. And the body is very sweet and has a light touch of hops at the end uncomplicated. And I, and I kind of like to think of applying that description to Bear himself, Bear the Mosasaur. Uncomplicated animal, living a nice life, orange amber in, in color, and catching lots of animals and eating them. So that would be Bear. So there are a few other marine reptiles. So Kansas, Kansas which is another great uh, area for chalk exposures, has discovered six different species of plesiosaur. 
And th th this is one example here. This is Styxosaurus, so beautiful, uh, beautifully preserved specimens. And once again, they included stomach, stomach contents, so we know that they were mainly fish eaters. And then there were Pleosauruses as well, with ammonites and pterodactyl bones in their stomach. So I, you can imagine this Pleosaur maybe jumping out of the water, leaping out of the water, much like the orcas do today, to take down a pterodactyl that was flying past, which is pretty amazing. And they also found some marine birds in the stomachs of one of these animals as well. And it's interesting that they haven't just found marine reptiles in the chalk in, in Kansas. They've actually found two hadrosaurs and six nodosaurs. And it seems like these, these ankylosaur animals have a particular tendency to be washed out to sea. So maybe they bloated in a particular way. So interesting to think about why, why that is and why we find more nodosaurs than any other animal in the chalk in terms of dinosaurs. So just to conclude, first of all, it's very interesting to see that a lot of these animals appear to have adapted themselves to a thick cetropic su substrate. So that's uh, uh, the soupy substrate. So first of all, we have these epibioses, these animals that are living on anything solid that's projecting above the sediment water interface. So we talked about hard grounds earlier, but we also talked about these e echinoid, these sea urchin tests, the shells that were s forming small islands for these animals to live on. So I equate those to something like this, where you have an island floating island, and this is in a flood, with people on it. So they're, they're, they're trying to find anywhere to make a habitat. Secondly, we have um, brachiopods, the brachiopods which are developing these very long legs. I didn't talk about these because they're, they're not well preserved as fossils, but there's definitely evidence that these brachiopods had very long, um, they're called pedicles, so the, the stalk that attaches them to the seabed. And I equate them to something like this, where we have a, 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 st a house on stilts, to stick itself out of, the, out of the sea. Then we also have a lot of spines, frills, and other adaptive structures which are used to kind of hold yourself up. And I was going to use the snowshoe as an analog for that, but you could equally use skis as an analog for that. So any way to try and support yourself on relatively soft sediment. And then finally, we had our famous Haginoia here with his very long anus. And I equate that to these bog snorkelers. <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, I, this is a very good, a very interesting English tradition to go bog snorkeling, and they have these bog snorkeling races where they swim along in, in very stagnant pools and stagnant ditches, and I, I equate those snorkels a little bit like uh, Haginoia's back end. So final thoughts, as you can see, nature seems to find a way, whatever the substrate, whatever the, the depositional conditions, there's still going to be animals living there. And it's very true about the fluid seabed of the chalk. And when you do see some of the weird adaptations that animals have as they evolve, there's usually a very good reason for them. So things like seeing that sea urchin with those ridiculous club-like spines, it's nice to know that there could be a, a really quite a rational explanation for something that has spines that are five times the size of the animal itself. And we can ap apply some of these ideas to human endeavors, although I'm not really sure about the bog snorkelers. And the next thing to do is to look, look at some of the inventions that we've come up with to get around some of these troubles and challenges that we have in life and to see whether they exist in, in nature as well but have not been recognized. So uh, one, of the, one of the examples that I was looking at is I, I was reading about quicksand to, as a background to this, this talk. And th there's, they now have a jetting tool that if somebody's stuck in quicksand, and particularly if the tide is coming in, then they have this jetting tool that they poke into the, the, the sediment. And so they can put a lot of water in there to try and fluidize the sediment more to get them out. And I wondered whether maybe there are some animals that might do, do the same back in the chalk times. So that's just one example of how we might use modern ideas to try and explore back into the ancient. And finally, I was just going to say, without the chalk, there will be a lot of people in big trouble, and all of these guys are busy using the chalk. There's a chalkboard. Climbers would have a lot of trouble. Gymnasts would be falling off the bars a lot more, and pavement artists would be really struggling without chalk. And my daughter would also have some very long summers if she didn't have chalk to help her out. Thank you very much. <laughs>